Good morning, Oasis Church. How is everybody this morning? All right, all right. Join with me and let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. Well, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all of Everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure. Y'all gonna sing with me this time. All right. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all along. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Thank you, Glenn. Donna, good morning. How's everyone? You, you may be seated. I'm Eric Loudermilk, and turn pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens, and we're glad that you're joining us in person and online, either live on Facebook or YouTube. By the way, a shout-out is due to Stephanie uh, Allman, uh, who did a study of our social media that last year and presented some findings to us. And as a result, uh, the, the leaders uh, spent some money so that now we're live on YouTube. It's not a delayed response. And I just want to acknowledge what an impact Stephanie has made in helping us to get the Word of God out. Amen. A couple announcements. Um, sweet Second Sundays. Now, I missed the uh, other one because I was with my mom and dad in North Carolina. But the next one's coming up July 10th. And we're a part of the Curry Ford little cooperative of churches, and these churches are working together to not only help us to love on our community, but also we're doing a back-to-school backpack drive. So these two things are together. Our next sweet second Sunday will be at Kelly's? Yes. And I don't know the address that, but uh, I think it's on Kaylee. Yes, on Kaylee. Uh, you might have to be a little creative in parking, but I'm looking forward. I'm an ice cream fanatic, but I've never had Kelly's. Don't kick me out of Orlando. Uh, our job of all those churches is to collect notebooks and packets of loose notebook paper. And we're not doing great on it. We, we have like 12 packs of paper back there, but that's all been brought by one person. So make a note on your phone or something to either get some notebooks or packs of paper. Actually, we need to get notebooks and, um, and bring those in so that we can fill up. Stephanie, are we doing 50 backpacks between the churches? A hundred. So we need a hundred notebooks. Okay. Have I missed anything? Any announcements? Yes, thank you very much, Pat. Our dear friend Becky Alves passed away uh, last weekend. And uh, her daughters, Becky's been a longtime member of this church, but her health has been failing. Her daughters, Melanie and Heather, are putting on a celebration of life service this Wednesday at 5 p.m. And it's going to be a little different because 
Becky wanted to celebrate her life and her life now with Jesus and the Father. So come out this uh, week on Wednesday at 5 and send a card to Helen, M Melanie, and Heather and uh, try to consider encouraging them during this time. Okay, you guys have a song before the message? We don't now? Okay, it's a quick, quick change of plans. Well, I'm going to have to go back down and get my notes. I thought that's what I was doing. Oh, now they're going to do that song. Why don't you grab that song? Uh, our normal, you know, this is a, let me just mention two prayer requests, because we may do prayer a little differently today. Our, uh, we have a rotation of worship teams. And you may know Adam Jinks, a tall, slender fellow who plays guitar. Today was his day, but he came down with COVID yesterday. We don't think it's a serious case, but we want to pray for him. And we also want to be praying for Eleanor uh, Compton. Eleanor went to the hospital this weekend uh, and uh, for a normal checkup. And while doing a normal checkup, they discovered she had some sort of heart irregularity. And at some point along that way, she had contracted COVID. We don't know if it was in the hospital or not. Then, before, they were going to let her quarantine at home, but she had a heart attack. Well, she fell and injured her head, and then, we don't know if this is as a result, had a heart attack. You know, Eleanor's been a part of our body for a long time. She now lives on the West Coast. So, let's just pause a moment and pray for those two friends, and then I'll grab my notes and we'll get started with the message. Well, we'll let them lead us. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your house is open to us and we're free to worship. We ask that you would anoint the message today, that you'd help me to speak the right words. But we pause now to lift up two friends in particular. Adam Jinks, who served us so well leading worship. We pray that you give him a quick and speedy recovery from COVID. And also, especially Eleanor, who is, I think, on her 100th birthday right now. And... She's been moved from her home. She's a, a little more lonely over there. And now she has a multitude of issues that add to that loneliness. We pray for healing for Eleanor. That you would touch her right now in her hospital room. Lord, we believe that you are the healer. And we pray you touch her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We uh, was planning to do this right into the other song when we were doing the first song. But uh, I think it worked out well to have the prayer for Eleanor. Our, uh, our song is going to be Jesus Draw Me Close. And I do all of you, want all of you to stand. And let's try to be in a prayerful mood as we sing this song. Stand, please. Jesus Draw Me Close. Close, Lord. close today as we draw close to you you've told us in the bible if we do that you will be near and dear to us so as we come today sometimes feeling rushed worried so many different things on our mind i just pray that today we can draw close to you and you will draw close to us i already feel it lord i thank you in jesus name let's sing it one more time jesus draw Closer, Lord, to you, and let the world around me fade away. Jesus, draw me close, closer, Lord, to you, for I. Desire to worship. 
music together in less than 24 hours, and I appreciate that. I'm going to make a little bit of adjustment here. We'll just have to put it back. <clears throat> it's good to be back. I had uh, two weeks with family, and uh, that was good. I actually spoke in two churches in North Carolina, and I uh, really enjoyed my time. Today's message is the, we're continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> we have been doing this series since the spring, and um, you can see the previous uh, messages um, on YouTube, and I would, if you haven't seen those, I pray that, I hope that you would take a minute to, to check those out. Our passage today is going to be Mark 5, 21 through 43. Mark 5, 5 21 through 43. Um, and the title today will be Jesus Loves Our Daughters. Jesus Loves Our Daughters. So while you're turning to Mark 5, 21 to 23, let me remind you of the format of some of these messages in this series. Part of this is due to Mark the way he writes and the way Jesus ministered. Jesus never wasted any time or effort. And part of it is due to that my primary calling is teaching and not, not preaching. The old preaching theory was that you had one main idea and you drilled that home all through the sermon. Newer experts on preaching are saying, no, that's not the best thing. The best thing is to preach the text, whatever the text says. The problem is that Mark has so much to teach us in one little story uh, or today, two stories put together, that it's difficult to do that without readers getting lost. But we're doing things differently here. We are reading through the Gospel of Mark uh, repeatedly, and we're encouraging you to read it on your own. We have a contest for those who read it the most, and hopefully we're teaching you how to read. Now, we have those 30 and under. Who's read the Gospel of Mark at least once, 30 and under, in this series? Joe and Sam, Sam, you were the bomb in Galatians, right? Have to get on the. You, let's hope next week you can be the one who says one. Now, thirty-one and older, who's read at least once during the series? Melissa and Kathy, who's read at least twice? Oh, Dave's read it twice. Anybody else twice? Melissa three times. <laughs> we have a new champion. Four times, five times. Melissa six, seven, eight, eight times. My current Gospel of John graduate class are reading through the Gospel of John. I give them three times they have to read it, and then they get extra credit for three more times. So you've already whipped up on my graduate students. And another shout-out, Melissa messages me and says, what's going on in this passage? So under this format, I'm also teaching you how to read and then trying to embody some of the points in the passage. But to fully get it, you need to follow that example sitting back there in the red sweater who's reading it on her own. So our first point today will be on just that, how to read this story in Mark. And then we'll make two other main points. Okay, let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Mark 5, 21 through 43. Jesus heals a woman and Jairus' daughter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and implored him. Some translations say begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, or some versions touch her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Now a great crowd followed Jesus, and they thronged about him. And there was a woman who'd had a discharge of blood for 12 years. 
and who had suffered much from under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better off, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd. You have to kind of think. This crowd is gathering by Jesus at the sea as soon as he gets out of the boat. Jairus comes up, and now they're moving in that very close crowd. So she comes up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, if I just touch his garments, I will be healed. I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now before we keep reading, think about if you're Jairus. My daughter's dying. Let's get moving here. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, just believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they, began, and they were immediately overcome with amazement, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you be with us today, that your words would be heard and not mine. It's one thing to feel a message in the heart. It's another thing to say it appropriately, Lord. And we need your power today. I pray that I a sinful, broken person, can hide behind the cross in your grace and that your words would be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I have to give another little shout out. I think we have five in Children's Church today. And in the COVID break, we prayed and prayed and they said we're going to train a Children's Church team and put them in place and trust God for the rest. And I think today we've broken the record for many a years ago. Or I don't know how long ago, but we're very glad for that. And all the parents here today, and grandparents. Two of the children are my grandchildren. All right. Listen to this story. In April of 2022, James River Church, James River Church campuses saw more than 1,000 people make first-time commitments to Christ. Since Easter, more than 350 people have been baptized. And in the last year, there have been over 300 written testimonies submitted of people being healed, with an estimated three or four times that number of healings that have actually taken place. James River Church is a multi-campus church located in southwest Missouri that sees around 11,000 to 12,000 in attendance every weekend. That's where we attended when I was in seminary. Pastor John Lindell, who founded James River more than 30 years ago, has been in the ministry with his wife, Debbie, for 37 years. Says in a voice filled with awe, in all my years of ministry, I've never seen anything like this. Like what? Well, in the, altar, off in the article, there are three or four testimonies of healing, and a couple of them are from daughters. And since our topic today is Jesus loves our daughters, I'm going to read two. Hearing restored. When she was a young child, Rachel Ann Coulson was diagnosed with degenerative hearing condition. 
Doctors estimated that by the time she was 30, she would be totally deaf. In July 2021, the 23-year-old was 75% deaf in her left ear and 50 to 60% deaf in her right ear. Hearing aids helped, but often words were still fuzzy and difficult to distinguish. She laughs when recalling some of the struggles she had as a member of the worship team. But that July, she was part of the James River College worship team serving a youth camp in Indiana. They had a Holy Spirit healing night at the camp, Colson says. I was leading worship and praying over the students when I felt the Lord tell me, start praying for yourself. Handing off the microphone, Colson began to pray. Soon, other members of the worship team gathered around her praying. Then students started surrounding her and praying fervently as well. The speaker, Pastor Justin Smith, then anointed her with oil and began to pray. The first time he prayed, there was no change. So he prayed again, and after just a few minutes, I heard this pop. And all of a sudden, I could hear what everyone around me was saying. Everybody was so loud. I just started sobbing and shouted out, I can hear! So then she shared what God had done for her as the students cheered and praised God. When she visited the doctor, the doctor looked at her charts and shook her head. For no known reason, Colson's hearing was at 100%, and she admitted she couldn't explain it. I told her the Lord did, did this, Colson said. She was a believer and responded with, Hallelujah, praise God. Let me read another daughter healed. Bones restored. Tammy Parsley has been attending and serving James River for decades currently leading the church's preschool and data team. It was 2019, and Parsley, then 51, was helping her husband move a couch when she literally heard and felt her, bra- her back break in excruciating pain. They headed to the ER where their fir- fears were confirmed. The doctor told me I had fractured the L5 vertebrae and had a hairline fracture in the L1. But they had a more serious concern. If a bone breaks when you fall, that's one thing. But if it breaks when you lift, that can signal something more serious. Under normal stress, bones shouldn't just break. Parsley went to a clinic in Dallas to be evaluated and have a bone density scan. I had scans in 2015, and they showed normal, healthy bones. But when my scans were done in 2019, my bones had fallen into the identification range for severe osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is basically the deterioration of bone tissue, which weakens bones, increases the risk of fracture. Parsley already had two fractures. However, after multiple tests, they could not figure out why she was experiencing bone loss. She made other appointments with specialists, including the Mayo Clinic, a specialist in St. Louis, and another university in Texas. She also became an avid researcher of bone health. So you need to get the point that time is passing. She's trying to figure this out. In 2000, in a later scan, her results were even worse. In 2021, her bones had declined even more. So this continues to go on for some time. Doctors couldn't diagnose her. She was getting discouraged. Uh, And she would ask people to pray for her. The journey was very hard and discouraging at times for Parsley. However, she was determined in her heart, like our woman with the issue of blood in Scripture today, and mind that she could walk through this as long as God was with her. So no matter what negative thoughts the devil might whisper in her ear, she decided she would continue to ask people to pray for her at every opportunity. Every time she went up for prayer, she could feel God's presence, she could feel his love, and that he heard me, but she didn't get a healing. In March of 2022, she was driving to visit family in North Carolina, and she suddenly remembered that in Charlotte, there was a clinic that specialized in bone issues, and it was time for her next bone scan. So she made an appointment. They have the latest technology, uh, and they did six different scans, and every report was no osteoporosis, bone strength good the doctor looked at her records and said i I can't explain this parsley says i'm bawling god healed me and he says 
no, this doesn't make sense. You don't, you don't have osteoporosis at all. When he said that, I asked him to say it again so I could record it on my phone, and he did. Since then, Parsi says she sent her results to all the doctors she's visited. Some who are believers were excited with God's healing for her, um, and others were perplexed, lefting, left putting their minds around the miraculous, trying to wrap their minds around it. That's a little bit of a long of an opening, but it might prompt some questions. James River's going through this massive revival. We haven't heard of one of those in a few years. Some of you, me included, might have some nagging questions. Is it real? Why do some of us have this uneasy, unidentifiable feeling in our gut when we hear stories like that? Would such a move of God make us uncomfortable at Oasis? And then the question some people have a hard time admitting they're asking, or maybe you don't have a hard time, would, would weird stuff happen if that happened? By the way, it always happens. In Acts chapter 8, we hear of the guy named Simon Magus who wanted to purchase the ability to do miracles. It always comes out. How about the question, well, if I pray and try to believe God for it, would it really happen for me? And this unspoken gut feeling I'm afraid to pray, and if I pray, and it doesn't happen, I'm embarrassing God or me or both. Maybe you can't even put that in the words, but maybe that's this impetus holding you back from those prayers. Or then the other question, I've been praying for years and years and years, and God has done nothing. All right, there's my intro, and half the sermon time is gone. Let's go through our points. Point one, how do we read this story in Mark. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that when we open in verse 21 of Mark 5, Jesus is back on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And for our whole series in Mark, I need to remind you, and we'll pop through these slides quickly, William. First, this is an overview of where the Bible story takes place. I don't want to ever assume that you know all this. Egypt down here and Israel is there to the right. That's the same place Israel is today. Now we're going we're gonna to focus in on this strip of here. Let's go back one. This strip here, Dead Sea and Sea of Galilee. Now go ahead, William. And we have the Sea of Galilee at the top and the Dead Sea at the bottom. And Jerusalem is just, just above uh, the Dead Sea. We still don't know why those pops happen. Next slide. Now, this imaginary line separates in Israel uh, from the Jews and the Gentiles. It runs... This imaginary line runs from the Dead Sea in the bottom up the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee on the top. Next slide. And with that, what I want to remind you that you wouldn't know unless you'd study this, that mostly the people on the left are Jewish, mostly. And, and then on the right hand, mostly the people on the right are Gentiles, non-Jewish people, which Jews considered unclean, sometimes unfit for salvation. Jesus now is in this upper part Next slide. Around the Sea of Galilee. Much of his ministry is up there, especially early in his ministry, and later he goes down to Jerusalem. The last message in this series, Jesus was in that area, but on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where he cast out the demon from the man in the tombs. It may be me hitting this thing. I don't know. I'll be careful. And now he's back on the Jewish side, and we have a star for that. He's somewhere in that area today. It's good to keep in mind geography because it's going to explain a lot. Now, the next thing I want you to do, if you were reading this passage over and over, if you were the Melissa uh, of this congregation, and you're really, you've read this eight times, you might want to get out pen and papers you're reading and start marking the parallels between these two stories. Both main characters are females. Both are called daughter. Both, the number 12 refers to them. The little girl is 12 years old, and the woman with the issue of blood has been battling this illness for 12 years. We have the issue of fear in both stories. More importantly, both stories have an element of delay. Why doesn't Jesus heal now? 
and then an immediate healing. So the girl's healing is delayed by Jesus stopping, and the woman's healing has been delayed for 12 years. Now, if you remember a little bit, in our first or second message, we talked about the word immediately and what it means in Mark. Who does the word immediately represent? It represents God, or Yahweh in Hebrew, coming through to get the job done, and nothing is going to get in his way. So let's go to that next slide. With the, we have the title slide. This is our title lot slide for the series, and that's why we have a straight road. And what it is, is every time the word immediately comes up, it's a homonym. It's basically off the same root as what we hear John the Baptist say in Mark 1, 3, 3b. Prepare the way for the Lord. And in Isaiah, that is the word Yahweh. Prepare the way for God himself. Make his paths straight. And that's the same word, same root used here when Jesus immediately healed her. Next slide. That also means, as Isaiah says, no mountain or obstacle is going to get into God's way. And in Mark, that's Jesus. Make straight in the desert. You can see the desert would be a hard place to make a highway. Nothing's getting in his way. Make what straight a desert highway for our God. Okay, <clears throat> just running through this quickly now. So, next slide. The other thing that is so significant between these two stories uh, is faith. Both stories are the person is encouraged or she has incredible faith. That's another parallel. It should start you thinking these stories go together. And then the last thing is our favorite sandwich technique. All right, you remember that? Now, I've had one of you come back to me and say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I get the sandwich technique. Mark is probably the author of the Gospels that does this the most. He'll take two thing, one thing, put it in two places, and stick something else in the middle. Um, the fig tree withering earlier in the Gospel, or maybe later, I didn't check the reference this morning, <laughs> the fig tree is cursed, and then the, the fig tree loses its fruit, and in the middle, uh, Jesus cleanses the temple in... Uh, Israel, he rebukes the people, really, because they are not being fruitful in being a blessing to all the earth. That's the sandwich technique. What do we have here? We have a young girl needing to be healed, and a young girl healed, and in the middle, we have a woman healed. And there's a reason all that's there like that. So what's in between the two parts of the young girl being healed? Well, what's in between is interruption and delay and then an immediate healing. We have an interruption, we have a delay, and then we have immediate healing. Now stay with me. This applies to you. Remember the women in James River who waited years for the healing? Remember the things in your life that you said, God, why haven't you healed? Why haven't you fixed this problem? Now, lastly in this how to read this story segment, when we have two characters with so much in common, often the biblical writer is inviting us to stop and compare them. Stop and compare them. The Old Testament does this with Saul and David, Judah and Joseph and others. So we're going to do that next, our point two. We're going to stop and compare these two daughters, and it's going to show us how Jesus loves the two daughters in their particular situation and how Jesus still loves daughters today. All right, point two. Jesus loves daughters wherever he finds them. So what you probably wouldn't notice, uh, unless you, you just got into to books and studied this, is there's a huge social contrast and gulf between these two women. A huge gap. So Jairus is a powerful local official. He's one of the rulers of the synagogue, maybe the only ruler of that synagogue. And he's male. And sorry, ladies, but in that culture, that puts you a step up worse than it does today. Likely, as the ruler of the synagogue, he's responsible for the finances and the upkeep of the, keep of the synagogue. Sometimes they or their families actually paid for and built the synagogue. We actually have an inscription that we, we have in our possession today from those times about a ruler of a synagogue whose family's wealth 
had built the synagogue years earlier, and now he's responsible and financially responsible for its upkeep. So he's wealthy. Sometimes these are also the leaders of the worship services. He's a religiously elite person. Now let's talk about our bleeding woman. In that culture, such a woman was a social outcast. One commentator calls it a huge social gulf between the two. She was broke. She had spent all her money on doctors. And her very illness made her ritually unclean to other Jews, like a leper. So if someone touches her, they have to remain away from other people and not touch other people for a period of time. And Jesus is considered a rabbi. And he's on his way to heal a little girl. And as, as he's going through the crowd, an unclean woman touches him. In fact, there's a reason she's doing it from behind. She doesn't want to make a scene. If I could, if I could just touch his garment. See in verse 33, Mark 5, 33, how in fear and trembling, she's the one who may have made him cold, uh, unclean. It says, But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the truth. The reason she's fearing and trembling is she's hoping he won't act like a typical religious Pharisee of the day. I've made him unclean. But Jesus insists on personal contact with the healed woman. Why? Because he cares for and loves all no matter their status, including both the wealthy and the unclean, poor, sick dog. A rabbi saying, who touched me? The shock the ancient reader feels, knowing that she may have defiled him and she could be in trouble. The unclean healing interrupts and delays the higher socially ranked clean healing. Jesus stops and shows deep concern for both women, for both daughters. One, in allowing an eruption, interruption for the unclean woman. And in two, in the gentle care of making sure the little girl is fed afterwards, showing Jesus' kindness. In verse 29, the woman uses a simple word for healing. I want to shift here, here a little bit and talk about more about how Jesus loves the women. In verse 29, the woman uses a simple word for healing. Uh, immediately, the flow of blood dried, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. But then to skip down to verse 34. Jesus takes it a step further. <clears throat> Daughter, your faith has made you well or whole. Go in peace and, here he repeats the word she used, be healed of your disease. Why this word switch? Well, she uses a simple word for healing, and Jesus repeats it, but he also says first, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Now that phrase, made you well, is one word in the original, and I found about nine translations in English that translates it as made you whole. That's probably the closest and most accurate of what Jesus is doing. Made you whole. Why? Why? Does it translate it that way? Because the original word Jesus uses is what we normally translate saved. Hey, Donna, you want to get saved? Hey, she's a little cold today. Maybe the air conditioner is too cold. She needs to be saved from the cold. Well, the, the biblical word save that we hear in Scripture, save from your sins, is this word. But it doesn't just mean the spiritual removal of guilt for sins. It's a much larger concept, save and salvation. It means to preserve or rescue from natural dangers or afflictions, to save or keep from harm, to preserve or rescue and save from disease or even from death. You see, when Jesus comes on the scene, he doesn't just remove sins, but he wants you whole from everything. We know this also in this passage because he then says, go in peace. Now, Mark's writing in Greek here, but Jesus is referring to the Old Testament concept of shalom, the Jewish idea of shalom. And I was in Israel in February, and I heard this all the time. This is the greeting, shalom. 
to, to wish someone shalom is to wish them to be complete, whole, or safe, to have a state of health or deliverance, to restore something that was lost, peace, prosperity, and success. So our modern Israelis are really awesome when they stop you on the street and they say, shalom. You are being wished such a great, encompassing restoration to your life. It's a very beautiful thing. And that New Testament word salvation carries all that with it. Jesus brings shalom, peace and wholeness to both girls. Not only the young, sweet, innocent young child, but the older woman shunned and dirty by society. And here we need to stop and make an application today. Which women are shunned in our society today? Which women are shunned in our society today? In light of this week's court ruling, I just want to mention a couple of things. Jesus loves all our daughters, no matter who they are, what they've done. <clears throat> for them to be restored, complete, whole, safe, and to have a state of health. He wants to restore our daughters whatever was lost. As many are celebrating this week about one court ruling, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, let's not forget all our daughters in our culture today. Let's not just think about those sons and daughters that will be saved in the womb due to the reduction of abortions, but let's also remember the daughters who were abandoned by the father of the child. The daughters who will be kicked out of their homes because of an unplanned pregnancy. The daughters who were raped by violent men. And the daughters who feel shame or shunned, like our woman with the 12-year issue of blood, because in the past, they've had an abortion. You know, we're all friends. I know most of you pretty well. And you know by now that I believe we're all sinners. And we tend to see ourselves as more righteous than someone else. And others as lower than ourselves. If you're like me, pleased with this court ruling, I want you to remember this. As God told Cain, that sin is crouching at our door. But we must rule it. Those of us who are pleased with this court ruling, I want you to remember that we are sinners, that we tend to look at others lower and more sinful than ourselves, and as God told King, sin is crouching at your door, but you must rule it. What do I mean? Conservatives are tempted to group all those seeking abortions as those who simply enjoyed sex and now want to escape the consequences of it. And yes, there are those. But we, the Pharisees in this situation, are actually worse than they are if we think that way. You see, this is just isn't in Mark. In John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the story of the woman called in adultery. Jesus refused to condemn that woman. And yes, after forgiving her, he did tell her to go and sin no more. But the story strongly implies that those who wanted to stone her were worse than she because they judged her as if they could have never done anything wrong. The leaders of that day, the conservative religious leaders of that day, were worse sinners than she was because they assumed a position of righteousness while wanting to condemn her. What's more, the text tells us she was caught in the very act of adultery, but the man was never brought forward to be held accountable for his part. Sound familiar? The man not being held accountable for his part. And I want no one to claim that in this message today that I, have, that I have implied that all desired abortions are from some sexual pleasure and sin. Part of the point I'm trying to make here is for us to be sensitive, to be merciful, and to offer shalom to all of our daughters, including those who are victims of rape and incest, those facing tough questions of, in the life of the mother those who are financially not in a great place. Life in a sinful world is never simple. And there are no simple solutions in this broken world. I hate to tell you that. Jesus doesn't fix it so no one ever dies. It's a sinful, broken world. 
And then secondly, while many celebrate this week because of the reversal of this decision, I challenge us with this reality. We can never consider ourselves pro-life if we check the box by a pro-life candidate. I'm going to say that again. We dare not consider ourselves pro-life just because we checked the box by a pro-life candidate. That does not make us pro-life. Controversial pastor and theologian Greg Boyd, with whom I disagree with much, suggests something that I agree with. If we want to be pro-life, we should consider taking out a second mortgage on our homes and using that money to take in an unwed mother. Now, this is one of his more radical ideas, but his point is that our lifestyles and resources must be geared toward and used for pro-life. And we should work to bring shalom, not only to the unborn, but to the mother as well. So, I ask you, in this second point, where Jesus brings shalom to all of our daughters, how are you, how am I, sacrificially giving of our resources to bring shalom to all of our daughters? Sacrifice your time. Boyd tells of a woman, he gives pseudonyms to protect them, a woman he calls Dorothy, who sacrificed her time to be a mentor to a young pregnant woman, Becky, and eventually became godmother to her child. Dorothy refused to give a simple moral lecture and instead treated this young woman like Jesus treated the unclean woman in our story who had been bleeding 12 years. She interrupted her life. She took time and she valued both lives of the mother and of the child. Now I ask you, where do your giftings lie? And where can you sacrifice for these things? Your money? Your resources. Some do foster care, adoption. But mostly, let me challenge you to sacrifice your pharisaical heart, my pharisaical heart. I'm not pointing to you. In any given day, I can catch my heart reverting to the self-righteous stance two or three times in a day. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at us. And not, not everyone can take in an unwed mother, but let me stop and not just preach. Let me commend two families. They're going to hate me for this. But the Coxes and the Georges have demonstrated this in the past, taking in people who don't have resources and sacrificing in their homes to bring in people that need shalom. Now, your journey may not mean that you can take in someone in your home. You may be an elderly, single person, a widow or a widower, and it just doesn't work. I'm not saying that's the only example. But start by sacrificing your heart. And ask God where you can help. Finally, let me reiterate that I am politically independent. I don't believe in mixing partisan politics with the pulpit, but I do believe in mixing values that are in politics with the pulpit. My role as a pastor and a professor demands that my loyalties lie with the Word of God and not with a party. And there are biblical values on both sides, though you may and I may feel that some values outweigh others. To summarize one female Christian in this area, partisan politics is about one thing, power. It's not a surprise when politicians engage in power-mongering, but it's a shame when Christians take part in this political party power-mongering game and allow it to change our first priority, dying to ourselves and sacrificially serving others to help them follow Jesus. America can fall apart. The kingdom of God will march on. I do not pray or hope or want America to fall apart. I have grandkids. Thus, there's more to celebrate this week as well. That some of our politicians laid aside this power game and work to pass another legislation to protect our children after they're born. No, the new gun legislation is not perfect either on either side. That too is a messy, difficult situation as well. But let's pray that they continue to work together to protect life before and after the war. Okay, enough meddling. Last point. My last point is on the main point of these two stories. Now you notice... 
this last point, next slide, is about faith and be, belief. And this is what's repeated in the story. That's the heart of the story. But as Jesus is healing based off of faith, he stops and addresses the cultural issue of the day, the woman who was shunned. That's why we stopped and did that today. But let's, let's go here. And this is actually a two-part message because next week is also about faith and belief in Mark. And we're going to combine these. The main point in these two stories is belief and faith. Same word in the original, one's a verb, one's a noun. Uh, there are different words in our language. They led to the whole and complete salvation of the girls. Shalom. You see, there was an obstacle in both healing stories that Mark wants us to know. What was that obstacle? Delay, interruption, which causes doubt. The delay in the journey to heal Jairus' daughter that led her to death and a 12-year delay in the sick, shunned woman praying to God heal her surely challenged their faith. To deal with this obstacle of delay, when we're asking God for a miracle, we must talk about the purpose of miracles. You see, we have it all wrong. Because, again, because of our self-righteousness, we think it's about us. It's not about us. It's about God and His love for us. So when delay happens in the miracles we need, we think, me, me, what about me? But yet Jesus here seems to intensify the delay and make it worse. Where else does Jesus do this? Oh yeah, John 11, the healing of Lazarus. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is really sick, and what does he do? John eleven six. 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, was Ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. And then he says first to the crowd, Lazarus is asleep. But then he clarifies in verse 14. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. So Jesus intentionally delays and is glad he didn't get there on time. Why? He says, so that you may believe. The end goal is not the miracle itself. The end goal is belief in Jesus, the Son of God, and wholeness here, but wholeness in eternity. We don't like it when Jesus delays his work, but we must be remember, remember that this is actually a repeated theme in the gospel. In John 9, 2, Jesus' disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, this is a grown man. Why has he been like this his whole life? Jesus answered, it wasn't because he sinned or because his parents sinned, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The purpose of miracles is not just to make people feel better or make them alleviate them of earthly suffering. No, the main purpose is to prove to us who God is and that he has a power to save, to make us whole completely. God does miracles. As Jesus told his disciples in the Lazarus story, so that we may believe. Think about it. Everyone Jesus healed in the Gospels died. Every single one of them. We have no record of anyone from the Gospels living forever. In fact, the end of Gospel of John disputes that myth. Jesus never said the beloved disciple would live forever. And the delay of healing or no healing in our lives is frustrating us as in the Lazarus story with the disciples and Martha. Martha says, my Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. What are you doing dilly-dallying around? So Jesus' purpose for that delay and in the delay of the daughters in Mark was to intensify the effect of his power, to show the power and glory of God. In all three instances, these two women and Lazarus, the delay puts the sick person in a place where they were beyond human help. It was either God steps in or nothing. And one of my students one time said, that's just the place God wants us. Where if he doesn't break in, nothing's going to happen. That's where he wants us, because he wants us to show us his power. Why? Because we have a hard time believing. So then in Mark now, the delay is followed by immediate, straightaway healing in both daughters. So when God in his sovereignty, decides to act, nothing's getting in his way. But that delay sometimes affects our faith. We read in verse 35, 
While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, overhearing what he said, turns to Jairus and says, Don't fear. Because he knows when there's a delay in what God does in our lives, we fear. We lose our faith. Jesus says, Nope. Just believe. And despite the delay, both daughters were healed. Why? Simply because of their amazing faith and belief for God to do his amazing work. At the beginning of this message, I highlighted God's current miraculous healing of some daughters today at James River Church in Springfield, Missouri. When I attended there, part of my role, I wasn't on staff, but I was a volunteer, part of my role was to go down front and to pray for the sick. Pastor John Lindell said, I've never seen anything like this before. Well, I never saw it there either. It was hard to pray for the sick when I had my doubt. Now, I have seen a woman healed of deafness when I was a little boy. No, a high school student. She was healed. And those nagging questions, though, still remain. Is it real? Why do some of us have this uneasy, identifiable feeling in our gut? Is God going to heal me? Why is he delaying Over 20 years ago, we laid to rest our third unborn child, Leah Victoria Loudermill. And in the hospital, I held her in my hands and I said, God, why did you not heal her? Why did you delay in this instance? And then yet a a year or two later, we had our miracle baby, William, who's 21 today. And through that, God shows his power in our lives. If you are struggling with God's power in your life, I challenge you to keep believing. Keep believing. Be like Bartimaeus and confess to God. I believe, Lord, but help me with my unbelief. I believe you. I believe you do it there, but it's another thing to come forward and let me pray for you. That's hard for us when we pray for you. We have to pray that same prayer, but I encourage you today to come forward and and ask God for a miracle. Today, Kathy and I are going to come down forward. No one in this church believes in miracles more than this one. And so, in a part of this two-part series, we're going to offer prayers to you. And it's not the custom in Southern Baptist Church to come up for healing, but if you're dealing with physical healing issues, emotional, financial healing, relationship healing, If you would come forward, we will lay hands on you and ask God and believe. He may delay, he may heal, but as a church, let's join in that today. Glenn? Uh, If you would stand with me and let's sing the CARES chorus. I cast all my cares upon you and I lay all of my burdens down at your feet and any time that I don't know what to do I will cast all my cares upon you I cast all my cares upon you I lay all of my burdens down at your feet any time that I don't know what to do I will cast all my cares upon you I will cast all my cares upon you I cast all my I laid all of my burdens down at your feet. Any time that I don't know what to do, 
I will cast all my cares upon you. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. I will cast all my cares upon you. As Donna's playing that, anybody feel like they're in a delay right now? You feel like God's delaying coming by or Jesus is delaying coming by? I sure have felt that. No doubt about it. So if you're feeling that this morning, this gives us a lot of hope. He's coming. He's coming someday. No doubt about it. So we're going to sing it one more time. I don't know if there's somebody else that needs to come forward, but somehow I'm told to sing this one more time. I cast all my cares upon you. And I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. I will cast all my cares upon you. Father, we thank you today for your goodness. We thank you for your presence with us today. Lord, we just pause right now to review our week. Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and clean us from all our unrighteousness. So we pause now to think through our week. Have there been any lustful thoughts? Have we been short with our spouse or our children? Did we cheat? Were we just impatient? Lord, the greater sins are in the heart. And so we pause now to examine ourselves. Lord, we confess these sins to you today. And we ask with confidence that you would forgive us of those sins based on the work of Christ on the cross. Lord, we lift up again those who are struggling in our congregation. Floyd and Ann West who have been struggling with physical issues. Faye Henderson who's not here today. We pray you continue to heal her. Lord, we lift up our government, our local government of Orlando our state government. We lift up the federal leaders of our land, whether we voted for them or not. We ask that you would work in their hearts, help them to sacrifice their power, to pass laws, and to lead in a way that brings shalom to our world. We love you, Jesus. We run to you. We ask you would come and meet us. In Jesus' name. Eric, I just, uh, I, th I feel like the people watching, maybe right now online, uh, I believe with all my heart, just like the lady who touched the hem of his garment, I believe that if you're watching this program right now, somehow through your computer or whatever, if you need healing, I believe God can heal you from where you sit right now. So I just pray in the name of Jesus, if you're praying for healing, I pray that you continue to believe, you continue to ask for that healing, and believe that it will come in the name of Jesus. Amen.
When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Uh, we let the words of this slip right by. Read the first verse. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, Longing just to bring something that's of worth to him, okay? That will bless your heart. I get up here and sing, and I look at this. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Now, when you come back to the heart of worship right now, it's different. And I can't do it right now. I worship you. Thank you, God. Thank you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. But it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord. Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Ushers, would you come forward? You may be seated. It is a pleasure as an interim pastor to thank you for your sacrificial giving. May was one of our best months ever. And through this body of believers, we have given a house of worship to three other congregations who contribute financially. And people are coming to Jesus in all four congregations. Marriages are being improved, and Jesus is being glorified. If you're a visitor today, you are not asked to give. You're welcome to. Uh, but the primary responsibility of giving is regular tenders and members let's pray father we thank you so much for what you're doing many times we don't understand things and we question and we struggle with faith but we're grateful for all that you've done and i pray god you would bless these families who have given repeatedly some even when it hurts sacrificially i pray you'd bless their homes and those who maybe are new, I pray a blessing over them, Lord, as they push in and follow you closer. Lord, give us three things with these monies. Multiply them for your kingdom. Give us wisdom as we use them, Lord. And help us to make sure they go to leading people to you in the Conway Gardens area. In Jesus' name. sing that chorus as we leave. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. All will see how great. How great is our God. One more time.
Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Hey, if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular, and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world, and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could, take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.